All right, let's turn to chapter five in your notes, slides. Chapter five deals with transferring title, changing ownership. That's all transfer of title means. It's a fancy way of saying a change in ownership. Anytime we change ownership, that's called a transfer of title in the property. So what's going to be the most common way we transfer title? We sell the property. That's the most common transfer of title. We're going to talk about this word called alienation. Alienation and transfer of title are really the same thing. Alienation just means separation. You're separating yourself from ownership of the property. Now, you can alienate yourself from the property voluntarily or involuntarily, and we want to talk about both. The voluntary type of alienation is called a deed. A deed. How many of you have ever heard that word before? A deed. You sign a deed. A deed is the document that is used to transfer ownership, to move ownership from one party to another party. We call that a deed. It's not a receipt. It's not proof of ownership. It is the document that actually transfers ownership from the old owner to the new owner. Here's what you need to understand about a deed. The moment it is signed by the grantor, now let's go back to those OR and EE suffixes we talked about. Would the grantor be the person giving title or receiving title? Which one would they be? Giving. giving. So in the traditional buyer-seller situation, who is the grantor? The buyer or the seller? Uh -huh. The seller would be the grantor. And the buyer would be the grantee, right? The seller is giving title. The buyer is receiving title. The moment the grantor signs that deed, ownership is transferred. That's the way ownership works in real property. You own it until the moment that you say you don't own it any longer. Does that make sense for everybody? And the moment that you say you don't own it any longer is the moment you sign that deed. Now, here's an important distinction. That's when ownership actually transfers. Nobody on earth cares about that moment. Even though that's the moment that ownership actually transfers. Because we need proof that that ownership transfer took place. We need to tell the public that that ownership transfer took place. The state of North Carolina doesn't recognize the moment that you sign the deed as the moment ownership is transferred, even though it was technically transferred the moment you signed it. What moment do you think the state of North Carolina is going to recognize as the change in ownership? When that deed gets recorded, when it becomes public knowledge. And where would you record it? At the county courthouse in the county where the property is located. So if the property is located in Wake County, you have to record it at the Wake County courthouse. Does that make sense to everybody? So the ownership is technically transferred. If I'm selling my property to Jim, for example, when I sign the deed as the grantor and I hand it to her, does she own the property? Yes. She does. Yes. She owns the property. The problem is nobody knows she owns the property. How does she tell the world she owns that property now? She records it. And here's the problem for Jen. The world is not going to believe her until she does that. Who is the world going to believe is the owner of that property until she records her deed? The, the grantor, the seller that sold her that property because they're the last person who came to that courthouse and made what we call a claim against the property. Will you hear me later in this chapter say someone makes a claim against the property? What they're actually doing is showing up at the courthouse and saying what? This is mine. I own this. This belongs to me. And the way I make that claim is I record my deed and I say, I own it and here's my proof that I own it because here is the last person who owned it and they are doing what? Transferring it or signing it over to me. 
Does that make sense to everybody? That is how the transfer of ownership works. So again, the owner is the grantor, the buyer, the person getting title is called the grantee. Notice it says down here that only the grantor has to sign the deed. Because only the grantor is actually doing anything. There's nothing for the grantee to sign because they're not doing anything. They're getting something. All they do is hold their hand out. It's the grantor who's doing all the heavy lifting, all the work of transferring titles. Does that make sense to you guys? So let me bring up this point right here. Whose job would you say it is to bring this deed to the closing? What are you going to be, the grantor's job or the grantee's job? The grantor's job. They're the one doing the what? Doing the work. They are the ones whose job it is to transfer ownership. They're, here's the thing. Here's what you need to think of a question like that. If I'm tipping the bellman at a hotel, am I putting my own bag in the car? Or is he doing it for me? So in other words, the person doing the paying does none of the work, right? And the person getting paid does all the work. Who's paying in a buyer-seller situation? The buyer, the paying is the buyer, right? So who has to do all the work? The seller, which means the seller's job to bring the deed to closing. The buyer's got to do nothing but show up with what? Money. Money, that's it. Everything else comes to them because they're paying for it. Does that make sense? See, I, I point that out because later on when we get to closing statements and you start having to try to memorize who, who gets charged for what, when you see a deed preparation fee, who's going to pay for that? The seller would. Seller would. It's their job to bring the deed to closing. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, Mike. Okay, so that was just their responsibility to bring the deed to closing. It's not their responsibility to make a public record. That's exactly right. Mike's question is it's their responsibility, the seller's responsibility to bring the deed to closing, but not the seller's responsibility to record it. That's absolutely right. The seller doesn't give a rip if it ever gets recorded. In fact, if I sell my property to you and you never bother to record your deed, I'd be perfectly happy for you not to record it. Because as far as the law is concerned, who still owns the property? I do. I do. Now let's talk about that for a second. If I still own the property, what do I have the right to do? Sell it. Sell it. Again. Because I'm still the owner of record. It's still, as far as the world is concerned, I own that property. So let me give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say that Mandy is buying a house from Jay. And they have agreed that Mandy's going to pay Jay $250,000 for his house. Mandy shows up with $250,000 in cash. Big suitcase full of money. And Jay shows up with the deed. So his job is the seller to bring the deeds. Everybody, does that make sense for everybody? Who's going to be the grantor on the deed? Jay the seller or Mandy the buyer? Jay the seller. Who's going to be the grantee on the deed? Mandy. Is everybody good with that so far? So Jay signs this deed transferring ownership to Mandy. Is it Mandy's property? Yes. yes, except who doesn't know that? Everybody. The only person that does know it is Mandy. That's it. Mandy's the only person that knows. She's got to tell the world. She does that by recording. Well, she leaves that meeting, and she knows she needs to record, but she's hungry. So she goes to get lunch first. Have a drink, celebrate. She's bought a house. What she doesn't realize is that Tommy has agreed to meet with Jay 30 minutes later. And Tommy has also agreed to pay Jay $250,000 for the property. Jay has another deed. Who, who's going to be listed as the grantor on that deed? Jay the seller or Tommy the buyer? Jay the seller. And Tommy the buyer is going to be the grantee on that deed. Does that make sense to everybody? Jay signs another deed. Tommy gives Jay a cashier's check for $250,000. Is Tommy the owner of the property? Yes, but who knows it? Tommy. Only Tommy. Tommy goes straight to the courthouse. When Tommy walks into the courthouse and, and he presents the deed to the clerk of court, Martina. Martina's going to do one thing. She's going to pull up the ownership record of that property. And realistically, what she's going to look at is the last 
deed that was recorded on that property. Because that's the last time somebody made a public claim of ownership. Does that make sense for you guys? And on that last deed, she's going to look and see who the grantee was. Because that's the current owner of record, correct? On that last recorded deed. And she needs to make sure that the grantee on that last recorded deed is the same person as the what on this deed that is attempting to be written as the grantor on this deed. He was the grantee when he got ownership of the property. Now he needs to be the grantor. Does that make sense for everybody? So she goes in the record. She sees the last deed recorded. She sees that Jay is the grantee on the last deed recorded. She sees that this deed has Jay as the grantor. It's been signed. It's been notarized. What's she going to do with that deed? Record it. Now, who knows that Tommy is the owner of, of that property? The world. You with me? An hour later, Mandy comes wandering in the courthouse. Now, Mandy also has a deed in her hand, does she not? And she hands a deed to the clerk of court. She gives it to Martina. She's smiling. And Martina does the same thing. She pulls up that property record. What is she looking at? The last deed recorded to see if the grantee on that deed matches the what? Grantor on this deed. Do they match? No, because the grantor on this deed is Jay. Who is the grantee on the last deed recorded? Tommy. Martino's going to hand that right back to Mandy and say, I don't know where you got this, but this person that does not, does not own this property, so therefore they cannot sell it to you. Yes, ma'am, Jody. How can there be more than one copy of because you're thinking, Jody's question is, how can there be more than one copy of an official deed? Because you're thinking of a deed like a title to a car. This ain't a car. A deed is not some piece of paper that came down off the mountain 6,000 years ago and exists with this piece of property and gets passed from person to person. Every time that title gets transferred, we write a new what? A new deed. A deed is just a transfer of ownership. So every time, when you bought your property, you get a deed. It's like an Oprah show. You get a deed, and you get a deed, and you get a deed, right? Because every time that property is transferred, it's not the same. We don't pull the old deed back out. We just draw up a new one and make sure the name, who was the grantee on the last one, is the grantor on this one. Does that make sense? So to answer your question of how there going to be more than one deed, Jay can write as many deeds as he wants. It ain't Jay's problem. Whose problem is it? Mandy's problem. Jay's in a non-extradition country already. <laughs> you have a 3 p.m. flight out of RDU. <laughs> uh, Jay said, good luck finding him. He's on a beach somewhere in Nicaragua, you know? He is, he is not coming back anytime soon. So the, the real question, I'll come just a second ago. So the real question is, what could Mandy have done to protect herself? What should Mandy have done to protect herself? <laughs> Report D before you do what? Before you give them the money. Simple as that. No, sir. I'm not giving you any money until we do what with this D? Until we record this D. So this is the reason that traditionally 200 years ago, where do you think closings actually happened? At the courthouse. You literally had the buyer and the seller meet in front of the clerk of court, and the buyer gave the seller the money, the seller gave the buyer the deed, and they instantly recorded it all in one spot. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, fast forward today, we don't do closings that way because the line out of the courthouse would be 46 miles long. Where do we go now to have a closing? A closing attorney's office. We still take the same precaution. Does the buyer give the seller the money when they're purchasing a property? No. Who do they give it to? No. Closing attorney. Does the closing attorney immediately give the money to the seller at the closing? No. What do they do first? They go and they record the deed at the courthouse. Does that make sense for everybody? And only then do they what? Release the money to the seller. 
So what Mandy could have and should have done to protect herself is employ the services of who? A closing attorney who would have held her money in trust until that deed was recorded. Does that make sense for everybody? Because they both have valid deeds, and that's what you need to understand about a deed. If it's signed by the grantor, it is a valid transfer of ownership. Does that make sense? Everybody with me on that? So it's up to the buyer. You're going to hear this phrase a lot in this class. The Latin version is caveat emptor. The most direct English translation is let the buyer beware. Real estate is very much a let the buyer beware transaction. In other words, it's up to the buyer to always protect themselves. Don't trust the seller. Have somebody else hold the money. Make sure that you've protected your own interest. Yes, ma'am, John. No, the answer my question. Answer your question. I understand everything you're talking about transfer title and how to pay the seller. I know all that. Yep. But I was just concerned as to why when Mandy went, well, when she didn't go to the courthouse, why was Jay okay to give a deed to someone else? How did he not know she was going to go straight there? Well, he's a he's a fraud. He doesn't care, right? He doesn't care whether it's Mandy or Tommy that he's ripping off. He just knows he owns one property and he's selling it to two people, and then he's flying out of town. And that's, I mean, I didn't say it was legal. Please yeah. do not interpret no, me to I say that. No, it is very like much not legal. Anyone can do that multiple times and get away. Of with course it. they can, unless who protects themselves? The buyer. The buyer. There you go. And that's why it's so imperative that the buyer does protect themselves in these transactions. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Isn't in like the state of North Carolina you're required to have a closing attorney? You are not required to have a closing attorney in North Carolina. Um, you probably will never see a transaction where someone does not have one for these very reasons. Um, but technically speaking, you can still do it the old-fashioned way and meet at the courthouse. Or you can just trust them and give them the money and they hand you a deed. But I don't ever trust it until that thing's recorded. And that's another reason, so one of the, that teaches you a very tough life lesson about being a real estate broker. Generally speaking, you're not going to walk out of that attorney's office with a check either. Because none of that money is going to get released until what happens? Until that deed gets recorded. So go ahead and schedule that closing for 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon if you want to. You're not seeing any money until when? Monday. Monday. Uh, you'll rethink that schedule of yours right there. That makes sense for everybody? Yes, ma'am, Jody. How do you get around as a realtor if your uh, client wants to purchase a home with a company, like in my example, it's a new build. They wanted the money transferred into the account before the closing, so I had to give them the money a couple days ahead of time before we went to closing. Transfer to whose account? The closing attorney's account? Yeah, we use the seller's attorney. The right. Well, the first of all, I never allow my clients to use the builder's attorney, ever. I've been in this business a long time. I made that mistake twice early in my career and never again. As soon as they say, you have to use our attorney, I look at them and say, watch me not. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> because... I am looking out for the buyer's best interest, and there is no way in Hades you can convince me that the attorney who represents the seller is going to hold the buyer's best interest at heart, right? So essentially, when a situation like that, you're trusting that the attorney will hold the money in escrow, and they will. They're not going to steal the money, I doubt. You know? What I would be worried about would be other things that they might not tell the buyer, like things they need to be cautious about about when buying new constructions like the potential for mechanics liens and those kinds of things because again they're not there to represent the buyer's best interest whereas a traditional closing attorney hired by the buyer would represent whose best interest the buyer's, the buyer's best interest and so ultimately and, and listen sometimes it does make things more expensive for my buyer because a lot of times the only leverage they have about you using their closing attorney is they'll tell you this one well we'll only pay for the attorney if you use ours he don't want you to think about this from there from that perspective. They're willing to spend seven or eight hundred dollars of their own money to have you use their attorney rather than your own. What does that tell you about the need for you to have an attorney? You need one. If they're willing to spend their money as the seller to have one for you, 
so that you don't have to pay for it, they're probably ripping you off in some regard. There's a huge benefit for them. They have found that over time it works better for them if they use their own attorney. Gosh, it always does seem to work better if you use your own attorney, right? Which is why it's always in the buyer's best interest to ultimately hire their own attorney. Now, your buyer will have to make that call, but I always stress that my buyer's high important. I think it is that they use their own attorney, even if they haven't paid the money. So how did it backfire on you when you first started out in real estate? How did it backfire on me? Because um, it, there were several instances, or two instances in particular, where the um, closing attorney was unwilling to provide any leverage when I did not believe that the builder had lived up to the terms of the contract. Generally speaking, see, you're not an attorney as a real estate broker. As a, as a non-attorney, I can only argue so much about what is and what is not in a contract because I very quickly venture over into the area of legal expertise. Does that make sense for everybody? And so once I pretty much say, well, this is what the contract says, I'm tapped out. I can't say, well, this is what's going to happen if you don't follow through and this is what's going to happen if you don't follow through. If we hired a closing attorney that represents the buyer and the seller, I feel, is not following through with their obligations on the contract, I pick up the phone and I call the closing attorney and I say, I need you to send a demand letter to them. And generally speaking, when you get a letter from an attorney on their letterhead that says, you have two days to comply or we're going to sue you, what do you get? A response. You get action. If you're using the seller's attorney, do you think they're going to threaten to sue their own client? They're going to look at you and go, hmm. oh well, that's not what they're doing. They will literally admit right to your face that the builder is not doing what they promised to do and they won't do a thing on the world about it because they represent who? The seller. That's the inherent disadvantage to that kind of, does that make sense for everybody? See, for me, I want somebody on my buyer's side. Okay. Right. All those things. So you need to hire experts to handle them. Yep. Well, and that's in most transactions. You don't see a seller with much representation for that very reason. Generally speaking, there's not a lot of risk on the seller's side. Okay? So voluntary alienations. We need to talk about a law called the statute of frauds. You need to star this in your notes. You need to circle this. It might be the most important slide we've talked about so far in the class because you will memorize it, but you still don't get it. This, you have to think. You, this, you remember we talked about level one, level two, level three things? This is a level three thing. And it's going to show up on a test in a lot of different formats. The idea of the statute of frauds is based on the fact that courts of law exist to do one thing. And we're not talking about criminal court, we're talking about civil court. Does everybody know the difference? Criminal court is when you've been you know, accused of a crime, you're tried, you may be convicted, or um, you may be found not guilty. Civil court is when you are being sued by another member of the public. Does that make sense? When two members of the public have a disagreement with each other, Civil court. And civil court's only purpose is to settle disagreements. If you've ever watched Judge Judy, that's civil court. Two people who have a disagreement with each other and they are relying on the court to settle that disagreement. If you are going to be the referee, which is what civil courts are, you need some rules of the road. This is one of the rules of the road for civil court. It simply says that there are certain documents, certain disagreements, certain matters that if you want the court to even be able to consider this case, the document must be in writing. It does not say that everything you want a court to consider must be in writing. If it did, we don't need to testify in court. Does that make sense for everybody? Do we have testimony in court? Even in civil court, do we have testimony? Judge Judy would suck if he didn't, right? He'd just be watching all the lady on television read. Right? So, of course, we have oral testimony about things. But the statute of frauds draws a line and says, these things that are on this list, because it's just a list of things, must be in writing if, and this is the part you will leave out, and it's the most important part. Because don't just tell me the statute of frauds says things have to be in writing, because that's wrong. The statute of frauds does not say things have to be in writing. It says 
certain things must be in writing if you want a court of law to consider them, to enforce them, to rule on them, then they must be in writing. So I'm going to make a statement right here. I want you to pay attention to this statement. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. The statute of frauds says that a real estate sales contract is covered under the, the, the statute of frauds. In other words, a real estate sales contract must be in writing in order to be enforced on a court of law. Everybody with me? Real estate sales contract is covered under the statute of frauds. Question. Does a real estate sales contract have to be in writing? I heard some yeses. The answer is no, because the statute of frauds doesn't say it has to be in writing. It says it has to be in writing if you want what? If you want it to be enforceable in a court of law. That is a different question than does it have to be in writing, because here's the truth. If we have a situation where Shannon wants to sell her house and Rennell wants to buy it, can they have an oral agreement for that? Absolutely they can. As long as Shannon shows up with money, and as long as Renell shows up with a deed, are we going to have a closing? Yes. What would be the problem if one of them didn't what? Didn't follow through. Somebody doesn't show up. Somebody didn't bring the right amount of money. What do they want to do? They want to sue. Can they? No, because the statute of fraud says if you want a court of law to intervene to deal with that issue, it has to be what? In writing. So they can do it with an oral agreement if they want to, but what they're giving up is the right to go to court if there's a disagreement. Does that make sense for everybody? So when we say something is covered under the statute of fraud, what we're ultimately saying is only put it in writing if you want it to be enforceable. If you don't care about it being enforceable, sure, have a handshake deal. Here's what you also need to understand. There are contracts and agreements which are not covered under the statute of frauds at all. What do you think that means about their enforceability? What do you think? They are enforceable. Not only are they enforceable, they're enforceable even when they're what? Verbal. If it's not covered under the statute of frauds, that means it's enforceable even when it's verbal. So if it is covered under the statute of frauds and you want to sue somebody over it, what do you better have when you walk in that courtroom? You better have paper. If you want to sue something over something not covered by the statute of frauds, what do you do when you walk into court? You tell them about it. You testify. That's the difference between the two. So I'll give you an example of a real estate contract that is not covered under the statute of frauds. A lease. Leases are not covered under the statute of frauds. Is a lease enforceable in North Carolina? Does it have to be in writing to be enforceable? No. No. Why not? Because it's not covered under the statute of frauds. What that means is that if you have a landlord suing a tenant, is the landlord required to produce a written lease in order for that case to be heard in North Carolina court? No. no, they are not. Because that agreement is not covered by the statute of frauds. Did I say it was a good idea not to have it in writing? No. no. Would it be better to have it in writing? Yeah. Yes. But you need to understand the very clear distinction. If something's covered by the statute of frauds, this, this is how serious this is. If we've got a deal where Zinia is selling her house to Lee and they videotape the conversation where Lee agrees to sell the house to Zinia for $200,000, they shake hands, whole nine yards, on videotape, and then Lee backs out and won't sell the property, and Zinia sues her, what is a judge going to say in that case? Case dismissed. Anybody, I got a tape, I got a, you know what they're going to say? It doesn't matter because I'm not even allowed to consider that. What am I allowed to consider because this is covered by the statute of frauds? Whatever's in right. That should also tell you something about making a verbal change to a written agreement right there. Is a judge going to care what you say you talked about? 
if it's something that's covered under the statute of frauds? Absolutely not. Because what's going to matter is what is where in the written agreement. Are you starting to understand the depth of this thing here now? Okay. So I'm not saying that real estate sales contracts have to be in writing. I'm saying they have to be in writing if you want them to be what? Enforceable. enforceable. If something's not enforceable, we call it unenforceable. So give me the word for a real estate sales contract in North Carolina that is not in writing. It is what? Unenforceable. 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 Can it still be closed? Yes, but it can't be enforced. You can't sue because that the statute of frauds says that document must be in writing in order to be held up in court. That, is everybody getting that? Because yeah. you've got to get that. I'm telling you, you have to be able to understand the statute of frauds. Okay? All right? So, the statute of frauds covers deeds. What does that mean about deeds? They have to be in writing in order to be what? Enforceable. Don't you dare just stop at they have to be in writing. That is the cardinal sin. Because you think in the back of your mind, oh, I'm smart enough to add to be enforceable. No, you're not. You're going to remember it exactly the way you spouted off to me. So when I say, what does the statute of fraud say about deeds, if you say they have to be in writing, guess what? That's a test plan. Sure, and it's wrong. Does a deed have to be in writing? No, not unless you want it to be what? Enforceable. Do you think most buyers would want their deed to be enforceable? So what should they insist on? The deed be what? In writing. Are you with me? Because it's not going to be enforceable if it's not. Does that make sense? Everybody so far? So good. Okay. Now we need to talk about the other law. Down here at the bottom it says, deed must be delivered and accepted. Accepted. In North Carolina, acceptance is defined as recordation. So you have accepted the deed when you've done what with it? When you have recorded it. This is where I want to talk about the Connor Act. The Connor Act is similar to the Statute of Frauds, but it, it's, it's more strict. What did I say the Statute of Fraud said about certain documents? They have to be in writing in order to be what? Enforceable in a court of law. They have to be in writing in order to be enforceable in a court of law. All of that is the same for the Connor Act except change in writing to recorded. Documents that are covered under the Connor Act must be what? recorded in order to be enforceable in a court of law. Well, I told you deeds were covered under the statute of frauds. Guess what other law they're also covered under? The Connor Act. A deed is not enforceable in court in North Carolina unless it is both written and recorded. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, you're going to have lots of examples of things that are covered under the Connor Act, lots of things, uh, examples of things that are covered under the statute of frauds. The first thing that should be obvious, it probably isn't yet, but if you think about it for a second, it will be. Everything that's covered under the Connor Act is covered under the Statute of Frauds. Because for you to record it, it has to be what? In writing. There's no way to record it unless it is first in writing. Does that make sense? So if we say something's covered under the Connor Act, it means it's automatically covered under the Statute of Frauds. Does it work the other way around? If I say it's covered under the Statute of Frauds, does it mean it's automatically covered under the Connor Act? It does not. Because there are certain documents, I'm going to say this one again, a real estate sales contract, we're going to talk about that a lot, I'm going to get the contract law, is covered under the statute of frauds, but not covered under the Connor Act. So if a real estate sales contract is covered under the statute of frauds, what must it be in order to be enforceable in a court of law? In writing. It's not covered under the Connor Act. Is it required that it be recorded in order to be enforceable? No. So if I was asking you, what do you need to do with a real estate sales contract in order to make sure it's enforceable, what would your answer be? Put it in writing. Do you need to record it? No. No. Does that make sense for everybody? How about a deed? What do you need to do with it? Record it. You need to record it. Okay? Everybody good with that? The difference between the statute of frauds and the contract. And these are covered under the Conrad. 
All right, we've got to talk about different types of deeds. Remember, these are all voluntary forms of alienation. We just said alienation was transferring ownership, separating ourselves from the property. It, this is when we have a grantor and a grantee. And voluntary means you're doing it of your own free will. Anytime a deed is involved, we're most likely doing a voluntary alienation. Does that make sense for everybody? You are doing it voluntarily. You have chosen to give up your ownership in the property for one reason or another. What's the most likely reason you choose to give up your ownership in the property? You got money. You sold it. You got money in exchange for it. Here's what I don't want you to forget. We're going to revisit this in a few minutes and see how much you paid attention. When you see this word, D, 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 D. A deed is a deed. They all do the same thing. They transfer ownership. That's all they do. Everybody with me on that? I don't want you to get yourself caught in the loop of thinking one does something differently than another. They don't. They all transfer ownership. Now, there are different types of them for a reason, and we're about to talk about that reason, but they all ultimately accomplish the same goal, getting ownership or title from the grantor to the grantee. Is everybody okay with that? Even in a foreclosure, there's a deed. There's a deed. So let's talk about the different types of deeds. Here's what I'm going to do first for you, though. I'm going to try to give this to you and it's close to a real world example as I can think of. Um, I can buy a brand new television today in three different ways. Same television. Same exact thing. Does that make sense for everybody? Three different prices. I go in Best Buy while there's still one that exists before Amazon shuts them all down. I go in Best Buy and I want to buy a television. I find a TV I want to buy. I get it off the shelf. I go to the cash register. They ring it up. What are they going to offer me? Warranty. They're going to offer me a warranty. Does the warranty change the television? No, I'm walking out the door with the same TV, correct? Exact same television. What does the warranty, does the warranty cost more money? Yes. It does. Then what does it accomplish? Well, it changed the price, but what does it accomplish for me? Why am I willing to pay more for it? Insurance, safety, guarantee, warm and fuzzy feelings. What do I, security is a good word, what do I know? How am I protected? If something happens to it, it's going to get taken care of and I'm not going to have to do what? Pay. Somebody else is going to pay to take care of it. Does that make sense? Somebody else is going to pay to take care of it. Now, if I buy the expensive one that Best Buy sells, can I go out in the parking lot and pretty much just run over my car three or four times and then bring it back in and say, I want a new television? Pretty much. Yeah, if you buy the super high-end one, I mean, because they pretty much figure you're not going to do that, right? You know, like, it would be very rare. I mean, well, what are you going to do? Just keep going back and forth and breaking DD for no reason? You know, most people don't do that. But it's pretty much an unlimited warranty. Does that make sense for everybody? It's expensive. You can buy property the same way. We call that a general warranty deed. A general warranty deed. When you buy property, when you purchase property, the grantor 
has to choose what kind of deed they're going to use to convey ownership to you. Notice I said, who's going to choose? The grantor. Now, just like Best Buy is going to choose whether or not to put the warranty on, do I as the purchaser, the grantee, have some say in that? When I go to Best Buy, do I have some say in it? Yeah. I tell them whether I want it there or not, right? And they're happy to add it as long as I'm willing to do what? Pay for it. Hmm. So do you think the grantee has some control over this in a purchase as well? They do. They can generally negotiate to get a general warranty deed if they're willing to what? Pay for it. Are you with me? What did the warranty get you with the television? Protection that what would happen? Oh. That it would work correctly, and if it didn't, because we can't really guarantee that it'll work correctly, what, that they'll pay for it. The seller will cover it. Does that make sense for everybody? That's a general warranty deed. A general warranty deed is a guarantee. It's not only a deed, it's a deed plus a guarantee. It's a deed transferring ownership, but it's also a guarantee that the ownership is pure that the ownership is unchallenged, that nobody else on planet Earth has ever had or will ever have any rights to the property other than you. And the reason that the grantor can give that kind of guarantee is because they feel confident that they already have that. Does that make sense? If I'm selling you my property and I feel 100% confident that there's nobody else on earth that has any claim to my property, could I not pass the same guarantee along to Mike who's buying my property? Does that make sense to everybody? Here's the thing. Does it put the grantor on the hook? Yes. Because if Mike has what we call a title defect, an issue down the road, who is he going to call? The grantor. Because the grantor did what? Guaranteed it. So let, uh, for you to understand this guarantee, let me talk about what we're guaranteeing against, the kind of thing we're guaranteeing against. Let's say <coughs> that Ivalice is selling a farm that she bought from Mandy. Now, Ivalice bought the farm 10 years ago from Mandy. Is everybody following me so far? Mandy inherited the farm from her mother. Okay? Mandy's mother purchased the farm in 1990. In 1990, when Mandy's mother purchased the farm, she bought it from a group of brothers and sisters who had inherited it from their father when he passed away. This is a real life thing, is it not? This kind of stuff happens in real life. There were ten brothers and sisters in this family. And the farm was left to them equally. Y'all follow me so far? How many signatures should be on the deed granting ownership to Mandy's mother? The deed where Mandy's mother is the grantee, how many signatures should there be on the grantor side of that deed? Ten. I hear ten. Man, this was a pitiful family. Nobody ever got married, huh? Oh. All ten were married. Twenty signatures. Two of the ten were dead, and their spouses were dead. They each had four children apiece. Twenty-eight signatures. So that deed granting ownership to Mandy's mother needs how many signatures on it? Twenty-eight. You see how that, that spirals out of control? Twenty-eight signatures. Now, did Mandy bother to check the deed when ownership got transferred to her? No, why not? 
So she inherited it from her mother, right? Her mother died. It's her mother's farm. She inherits the whole thing. She doesn't bother to check. Adriana, I'm sorry, Ivelisse is now buying it from Mandy. Are you with me? Everybody with me so far? Or no, Ivelisse is selling it. She bought it from Mandy. That's what I said, right? In that, in that way I worked back. Ivelisse bought it 10 years ago. Isn't that what I said? I want to make sure I got my story straight. Y'all help me. Somebody bought it who wants to buy it. Somebody wants, right. Somebody from wants Mandy. to now buy it from Mandy. Ivelisse wants to buy it from Mandy, right? Okay. So Mandy didn't bother to check the deed. But she inherited it from her mom. Why would I? Now, Ivelisse wants to buy the property. And Mandy's like, okay, I'll sell you the property. And they come to a deal. Ivelisse hires a closing attorney. The closing attorney does what we call a title check, title search, to make sure that every time ownership of the property has transferred, it has transferred appropriately. Does that make sense? Everybody with me on that? How many signatures is the closing attorney going to need to see on the deed granting ownership to Mandy's mom? 28. 28, right? So the attorney starts to count. There's 26 signatures on the deed. Is that a problem? Yep. Yes, because you have two people who probably at some point had an ownership interest. Does that make sense? And we don't know if they still do or not. Here's what we do know. They never signed saying they didn't. Could they have been paid for their ownership interest for all we know? Sure, and they just forgot to do what? Sign, but do we have any proof that their ownership was ever transferred to Mandy's mom? Therefore, do we have any proof that owner, that that, that two slices of ownership was transferred to Mandy when Mandy's mom died. Therefore, do we have any proof that Mandy owns the property by herself and can convey it right now to Ivelisse? We don't. Mandy needs some signatures. Does that make sense? Mandy needs to find those two people and have them do what? Sign a deed saying they don't own this thing anymore. Are you with me on this? Those two people are dead. One had eight children. Seven of them are married. The other's been married three times. I don't even know how many signatures Mandy needs. Do you know? A lot, right? Is that going to become very expensive to track down, to fix, to... Yes. Exceptionally. You see where I'm going? If you end up with that kind of a problem in your ownership history, you better pray that the deed you got is a what? A general warranty deed. Because if you've got a general warranty deed, Whose legal responsibility is it to fix that problem? The grantor who transferred ownership to you. Does that make sense? See, Mandy has a problem. I guarantee you she didn't get a general warranty deed because who was the grantor who transferred ownership to her? Her mother. Number one, dead, right? Number two, and if you leave it as a will, it's not going to be a general warranty deed. It would be a different type of deed. So Mandy's now stuck with all the costs because even Lisa's going to simply say, I'm not buying the property from you until you do what? Until you fix this. Until you clear the title. Well, Mike said, could she offer a jump? She could. But even Lisa's is probably not going to be willing to accept it once she's already found the problem. In theory, you're correct. But that assumes Mandy has the ability to fix it. If Mandy had the ability to fix it, wouldn't she already fix it right now? <laughs> exactly. And so, but that would be the exact risk the police would be taking. Because you're saying, would Mandy have to fix it? Well, Mandy would be like, well, if you want a general warranty, since the risk is a little bit higher for me in this case, I'm going to charge X amount of She could. And if Ivelisse is willing to agree to that, more power to her. Now, is, 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 is running a risk here? 
Huge. Huge. Okay, even with the uh, uh, warranty. Warranty's only as good as the person giving you the guarantee. Okay, so we're still relying on closing the gentleman to ensure that even the general warranty has credit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Property or whatever, can they just come in and say, Hey, I have ownership to this, so therefore, they can make a claim of ownership. Exactly. So, why would, why would she even like, attempt to buy it? Well, and they should probably would. The effect is, in most cases, you probably would stop the transaction right there. It's going to put the brakes on the transaction because any closing attorney that the buyer is hired to represent them at that point in time is going to say, Don't buy it. Exactly. Yeah, so Don't buy it. Like, uh, uh, that, I mean, that's going to put the brakes on it. Yeah, how far is that? Hold that one. Okay. Hold that question right now forever. Are <laughs> oh, we understanding the meaning of a general warranty deed? Yeah. So that word I just said is very important with a general warranty deed. Here's what you need to remember about it. The grantor is making this warranty forever. They are guaranteeing that there are no problems with this title, with the ownership of this property, all the way back to the beginning of time and all the way forward into the future forever. It is called warranty forever. Does that make sense to everybody? Now that sounds ridiculously harsh, but if you think about it, if I ask most people, how confident are you in your ownership of your property, what would they say? Absolutely confident. I got no problem giving somebody a general warranty deed when I sell my property. Because I'm very comfortable in the title search that was done when I bought the property. And if I was confident in that title search, and I'm confident that I haven't done to anything to endanger the title since I've owned it, I'm very confident giving the next person that guarantee. Does that make sense for everybody? I do. Well, Jen said I shouldn't. That didn't operate in a vacuum because most buyers are going to demand it. Most buyers are going to demand a general warranty deed. Most standardized contracts are going to specify a general warranty deed. Is everybody understanding me here? Yes, sir. Okay. Are we good with this? Yes, now let's talk about a limited warranty deed. I'm going to go back to the television analogy here. I had to think if analogy was the right word. I had to think back to seventh grade, right? You know, and here's a, this is weird. This is the stuff that goes on in my head when I'm talking. I'm like, okay. So if you're going to say oh, it's like when you buy the TV, then it's an analogy, right? Isn't that great? My seventh grade English teacher would love me for that. So. The television analogy. Can I just buy the TV and pay the sticker price on the shelf? Yes. Does it come with a guarantee? Yes. Mm -hmm. A manufacturer's warranty. Is that one going to be... Why were we willing to pay more for the other warranty? Because the manufacturer's warranty is a little bit what? Doesn't cover, Doesn't cover anything and everything. It's limited. It's limited in time. Make sense? Yeah. Guess what? We can do deeds the same way. We can have a limited or special warranty deed. And here's what's limited. The time that's covered. How long did I say a general warranty deed makes a guarantee for? Forever. Forever. All the way back to the beginning of the time and all the way forward into the future. It is guaranteed. Title is guaranteed forever. Is everybody good with that? With a limited warranty deed, the grantor is only guaranteeing the time they have owned the property. Essentially what I'm saying, if I sign a, a limited warranty deed over to Maggie, I'm saying to Maggie, Maggie, I guarantee you that I have never done anything that would endanger your title to this property. If somebody says that to you about something they're selling, somebody's selling you a car, and they say, well listen, I guarantee you I've always changed the oil on time. What would your natural question be? What happened before you got it? And what's my answer going to be? Oh, no, don't care. For you to figure out. But I guarantee you I always change your oil. I guarantee you I didn't endanger the title to this property. I guarantee you there won't be any claims that arise from the time period that I, the grantor, have owned this property. Is that very different than a general warranty deed? So general warranty deed guarantees all of time. A special warranty deed guarantees a very 
limited or short period of time, what do you think a quit clocking fee is going to guarantee? Absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, a quit claim deed does not even guarantee ownership. Here's what a quit claim deed says. It says this in legal terminology, but here's what a quit claim deed says. Listen to it now, it's important. This is what the grantors say. This is what they're certifying on a quit claim deed. Because remember, it's the grantor who's saying this on a deed. Grantee's not doing anything on a deed, it's the grantor. Here's what a quit claim deed says from the grantor. I don't know if I own this or not. That's really reassuring when you're getting something from somebody, right? I don't know if I own this or not, but if I happen to own it, it's yours. Well, doesn't that raise up a whole lot of questions? What would be the first question? Who else might own it? If you don't own it, how can you give it to me? And my answer is, that's for you to figure out. That's for you to figure out. That's not my job. My job is to simply say, I am quitting my claim in the property. Whatever claim I might or might not have. I'm not even telling you if I have a claim, but I'm saying if I have one, I'm doing what? I'm quitting. I don't own it anymore. Maybe I never did. Maybe I do. You figure it out. But I'm not giving you any guarantees. Yes, Ken. Now that's all the dead siblings, children, all their That's what Mandy needs a bunch of them to sign. They need also. That's exactly right. Everybody hear what Jen said? She said, man, in Mandy's case, when she needs these, all these folks to sign, these heirs that might possibly. Notice I kept using the word might, right? Did I say those heirs absolutely have ownership? No, because we don't know that they did. For all we know, their mama could have actually gotten her money, her share, and just forgotten to do what? Sign the deed. Remember, there's 28 people signing. It's pretty easy to forget two of them. Does that make sense? She was sick that day. She had 10 kids. She was clearly out a lot, right? You know, she was indisposed that day. So it could be that they don't have any claim of ownership. We're not saying they do. We're saying they might, and that's a problem. We call that a question or a cloud. It's a defect in the title. Mandy's title has a defect in it. Well, the way you clear up a defect or cure a defect is to have that person who might have ownership sign this thing called a what? A quit claim deed. Because isn't that the best statement of where they are? That person, when you go to them, do they know that they own it? No. no. So they sign something that says, I have no idea if I own it or not. But if I do, I'm doing what? I'm signing my ownership over to you. Well, and then Jen said, for some money. Isn't that also going to probably be true? Because when Mandy goes and knocks on the door of the first one and says, Hey, I'm Mandy, and I own this farm in Pitt County, North Carolina. I inherited it from my mama, and she bought it from your great aunt and her nine brothers and sisters and... Your great aunt forgot to sign when they sold the property. And so it's possible that you might own like one thirtieth of the farm. You probably don't, but it's possible that you do. And I'd really love if you'd sign this thing saying that you don't. What are they going to say? I own it. I've been telling my family, my, all, all, I, what I just telling y'all last week? Who was just talking about that farm I owned down in Pitt County last week? Meanwhile, they don't even know where Pitt County is on a map. But all of a sudden, they own it, right? They're, I mean, it's their family heritage. they got to have it. It's the way people are. That's why we buy this thing called title insurance. It actually comes up later in this chapter, but now's a good time to talk about it. Why do you buy insurance? In case something what? In case something happens. Well, title insurance is insurance in case something bad happens with your title. So if Mandy had a title insurance policy, it wouldn't be Mandy going to visit those people. Who would it be? Her title insurance company. And here's how that visit's going to go from the title insurance company. Let's say that Channing is one of the people that we need a signature from, right? Okay. So I'm going to go knock on the door now. 
I represent the title insurance company. I am an attorney. And I happen to have another attorney with me who also happens to be a notary. And we have in our possession one document, a quit claim deed, already made out. And the property is the farm. And who's the grantor on the quit claim deed? Channing. Because we want him to sign saying that he doesn't know if he owns it, but if he does, he's doing what? He's quitting his claim. Does that make sense for everybody? So we go up to the door and we knock on the door. And he comes to the door and he looks at me and says, who are you? And I introduce myself. I'm, I'm from American Land Title Association. And our client owns a property in Pitt County. And we have discovered that there is the remote possibility that you may own one one thirtieth of this property. Now, we do need to advise you the property is being sold for $300,000 currently. And so, uh, if you were to prove your 130th ownership, you would be entitled to $10,000 of those funds. Are his eyes going to light up at that point in time? Mm -hmm. ding, ding, right? You know, it's like spending a dollar on the wheel and the price is right. You just, you know, all the bills go off. Here's what I'm going to follow that up with. Now, it is our position that you do not own any of this property. And so therefore, we would like to request your signature on this document. Now, for your time and energy, we are happy to write you a check today for $500. This is a one-time offer. We will pay you $500 today for your signature. Should you choose not to sign, we will file suit tomorrow against you. We anticipate your cost to defend this lawsuit to be in excess of $100,000. We have pro we have tried and prosecuted over a thousand of these cases this year, and we have never lost one in 25 years. We'll give you five minutes to think about. It. What is Channing going to do? Where do I sign? Where do I sign? Because at most, how much can he possibly be owed if he proves his ownership claim? $10,000. Worst case scenario, he could end up with $30,000 in legal expenses and get paid what? Zero. And if it goes to court, that's exactly what he's going to get. Because they're going to have all the documentation on his side and he's going to have what? Nothing. Because the judge is going to look at him and go, so you're telling me that you claim you own one thirtieth of this property yet in... 28 years, you never bothered to pop up and even inquire about it? That it only came to your mind when somebody came knocking on your door? You know what a judge is going to say? Get out of my face. But not until Shane's racked up $30,000 in legal expenses to get there. Does that make sense? Because he's not only going to have to pay his own legal expenses, at that point in time, whose legal expenses he's going to have to pay? He's going to have to pay the title insurance company's legal expenses because they're going to win. And they have very expensive attorneys. So most likely, what's he going to do? He's going to take the 500 bucks and sign the quit claim deed, and then they're going to go on to the next person. And for them, they're not paying the 500 dollars because they think he owes it. They're paying it because it's the quickest way to do what? To get rid of the problem, to clear the title. Because ultimately, Mandy bought insurance to pay them to do just that. Does that make sense? Now, I've heard people say, oh, God, I, I bet title insurance is hard to get them to pay. No, it's not. How many times do you think somebody actually files a title insurance claim? Once out of oh, 10,000 properties, maybe? Hardly ever happens. And everybody has title insurance. If you own property in this room, you guarantee you have title insurance. And if you've owned five properties, I guarantee you bought title insurance five different times. And you'll go through your whole life and never once use it. And all your friends will go through their whole life and never want to use it. So on the one time when they do have a claim, they got no problem paying $500 to get rid of somebody. Does that make sense? And that's how they do it. Yes, ma'am. What's the name of you without title insurance? What is the chance you would have title insurance if you don't have a mortgage? That's a good question because if you don't have a mortgage, nobody's forcing you to buy it. If you get a mortgage, your mortgage lender is going to force you to buy title insurance because they want the protection of the title insurance. If you don't have a mortgage, um, you know, most people who don't have a mortgage still have title insurance because most of the time your closing attorney is going to look at you and go, did you bump your head this morning? This is $400 and it covers you for the entire time you own the property. 
it's a one-time premium that you pay once for the entire duration of ownership. So, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, it's very cheap. So most people do still have title insurance. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Martina's question was, if I inherited the property, is it a good idea for me to go and get title insurance? Yes, because if you inherited the property, you don't have title insurance unless you specifically went out and got it. And there'll be some cost involved, but there's a, I mean, it is a, a huge benefit, you know, to having that title insurance. It makes the property easier to sell. One of the big red flags when a closing attorney's doing, what do you think? If you're a closing attorney and you've been hired to represent a buyer and do a title search, what do you think one of the first things you look at about the property is? Does the current owner have what? Title insurance. Because if the current owner has title insurance, that means the title insurance company felt solid enough about the current owner's title to grant them a policy on it, which means you probably feel pretty good about the title right now. Does that make sense? Whereas if you are representing a buyer who's buying a property and there is no current title insurance policy on it, that's like a red flag of like, we need to look harder. And so it's a really good idea to get it. We, we are not. Deeds that are transferred via those are voluntary though, um, because the, there's a grantor. For any of you use the word grantor, that's a voluntary transfer. Okay. Yes, ma'am, Joe. What if there are minors, like in that case where there was 28, is it a parent that signs? Yes, the guardian. The child, so guardian. That's the that is correct. That's exactly right. It would be so and so uh, on behalf of or guardian of, or comic as their attorney in fact. That's the, you know, we use that terminology as well. Yes? Yes, because remember you didn't just build the land. The title insurance is on the land, not on the structure. You're not buying insurance on the structure, you're buying insurance on the claim of ownership of the land. So, absolutely, the status of the construction would have nothing to do with whether or not you want to, as a matter of fact, Buying a new construction home would probably be one of the best instances where you would definitely want to get title insurance because title to that property has probably changed hands several times in the years preceding you buying that home. You know, there was probably an owner of the land who sold it to a developer, who subdivided it and then sold the lot to a builder, and now the builder's selling the lot to you. That's a lot of transfers of title, so title insurance would be really key in something like that. And by wall, doesn't, like, I'm sure I wrote what I read something that a bank won't give you a loan unless you have title insurance? Well, it's not by law. Adrian, question is, by law will a bank give you uh, a loan if you don't have title insurance? It's not by law, but it's by their choice because they stand the most to lose. If they've loaned you a bunch of money on this property and then all of a sudden Lee comes in and takes the property away because she has a claim of ownership, that, that's a big problem for the lender because you're taking their collateral away. So they won't give you the loan um, unless you buy title insurance because it protects them. Specific one. Specific one. Yes. Taxes to the property. Right. Well, if you have a title defect, the property is locked down. And and not only are you unable to sell it, but the lender might not be unable to get their collateral out of it because they may have never if you didn't own the property in the first place, you can't give them collateral in the property. Right. They lose their they lose their collateral. Yes. Yeah, so we, that's that's called an, that's called an adverse possession. We haven't gotten there yet. That's an invo that's taking something. That's well, stealing something. Um, well, I was thinking that she had been there all that time. They could, but she's got to go to court and do that. She's not. She's trying to sell it. She's not trying to be in a, court, in a protracted court battle oh. at this point in time. Trust me, it ain't easy to go to court and just claim ownership of something. So. The best thing for her to have at that point how many title insurance. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my husband and I have a little property and we're going to sell it and we're going to have to get title insurance for it. Yep. You have 
important. Don't think of what kind of deed you have. It's what kind of deed you got. A deed is always a past tense thing. There's no such thing as what the current deed on the property. The deed was just there to transfer ownership. Okay? So what you got is a general warranty deed from the grantors who sold you the property who guaranteed title for how long? Forever. How long did your husband, your now ex-husband, guarantee title for? Or what did your now ex-husband guarantee to you? Nothing. Nothing. Because he is simply quitting his claim in the property. So, you have ownership, but you have no guarantee from your on your husband's behalf of that ownership. In other words, you have taken the risk that he indeed did have ownership to sign over to you. The problem is, because you didn't ask it the question, but I know where your mind is going, you think about how does that affect you in the future. It doesn't, because the, the deed you give in the future is completely and solely up to you. It's about what comfort level you have. So when you get ready to sell the property, what kind of deed can you give the next buyer? Whatever you choose. No, because he's already done what? He's already quit his claim in the property. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Are we good on these? So, on a test, because you're going to see this on a test, and they are going to intentionally make this as confusing as they possibly can. Lee has a deed which guarantees there will be no title defects whatsoever of any type, no matter the source, she will have no worry of claims against the property for any reason during the time that the grantor owned the property. What kind of deed is that? General warranty, special warranty, or quick claim? That is a special warranty deed. See, all that, all claims whatsoever from any source tries to make it sound like what? For general warranty. But the time period was how long? Just the duration of the grantor's ownership, which makes it a special warranty deed. A general warranty deed would be what? Forever. And no guarantees whatsoever would be what? Quick claim. Does that make sense for everybody? And make sure you can identify those on a test. We usually use quick claim deeds to do what we call clear a defect in the title. Whenever there's this question of, does the grantor actually have ownership? Does the current owner actually own the property? If there's any question, then the way to fix that question, the easiest way to fix that question, is to have the person who might have some claim sign a quit claim deed. Okay, you might have a claim. Well, guess what? If you sign a quit claim deed, you don't have a claim. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. The best way to make sure somebody doesn't have a claim is to have them sign a quick claim deed simply saying, I don't have a claim on this property. It's not mine. That's essentially what you're saying when you sign a quick claim deed. Whether it was or not, now it's not. It's not mine anymore. If it ever was, that's a quick claim deed. That's all it is. And so when we find these defects, the most likely deed we would use to cure them or fix them is called quick claim. All right? Um, there are some special t purpose deeds. You don't need to memorize these, but I will point out one. The correction deed, just because they use the word correct in the question does not mean it's a correction deed. Y'all have a habit of doing that. They love to do it to you on test questions. Um, Channing has a deed in which he was granted ownership of the property which was owned by four heirs to an estate. However, Channing's deed is only signed by three of the heirs. Which of the following deeds would most likely be used to correct this mistake? What is the answer not going to be? A correction deed. That's not a typo. A correction deed is there to fix a typo. What kind of deed is most likely to be used to fix that kind of a situation? A quick claim deed. That's a defect in the title. That would be a quick claim deed. Does everybody see the difference there? Correction deed would fix like you transposed letters in somebody's name or you left something out of somebody's name or misspelled a name or something like that. Correction deeds, yes. Yeah, it happens. It happens. 
you figure your yeah, average closing, attorney's closing four, five, six transactions a day. You know, um, they've been known to cut and paste things, um, leave the wrong property description on somebody's deed, like you're working on four deeds for that day, and you go in and you're cutting and pasting that meets and bounds property description. Because remember, when you look at a meets and bounds property description, you can't tell what property is for. It's not like you, the street address is in there. Does that make sense? You know. I mean, it, it, it just looks like gobbledygook. So, you know, they go and they find the meets and bounds property description and they cut and they paste it and they put it on the new deed and then they go and they, they go to lunch and they get a phone call and they come back and they're working on deed number two and they change the names, they change the grantor, they change the grantee and they don't change the description of the property. Well, everybody at the closing, nobody knows what the hell they're signing because nobody knows what the meets and bounds description of the property actually is. Does that, does that make sense? And then, when is that going to get caught? When they go to do what? When they go to record it that afternoon. When they go down to the courthouse to record that deed and they hand that deed to Martina and she looks up, remember, her job is to make sure that the grantor matches the owner of record, right? So she's going to pull up the owner of record of the property that's on this deed. She's going to be like, I don't know what you got, but these don't match. And the attorney's going to start looking and they're like, oh crap. <laughs> And so at that point, they need to file a correction deed. That's where a correction deed would be used. So yes, let's do that. That makes sense for everybody? So does it, get, does it get recorded at that time? They file, what they do is, what they do is they don't release the money. They go back, they have everybody come back, sign a correction deed, and then they will record the original and the correction together. Um, you sometimes sign something that says? You do sign something at the closing that says, if they need you to come back after the fact to fix, they call them scrivener's errors, then, you, then, then they can get you to come back, or you may give them your permission to fix them without you being there. Yeah. But either way, the mistake and the revision needs to be on Correct. That's exactly right. They're going to both get recorded. Because you can't record, you can't record a correction deed unless you record the deed that it's correcting, right? And you got to see that it was meant to correct this mistake. And in the case that, you, that the buyer gave or the seller gave the attorney authority to correct it without their presence, they would still need that original signature. Right. You got to show that they signed the wrong. Right. And so at that point in time, here's what they would record: they would record the original deed which the seller signed. They will record the corrected deed, which the seller didn't sign, and then they will record the document that the seller did sign, giving the attorney permission to make that correction. All three would get recorded so that there's a clear record that this is a legitimate transfer. Because otherwise, 15 years down the road, when this person is ready to sell the property, there's going to be a thing on the title, right? There's going to be a defect in the title because something doesn't match up. So you need all that documentation there. You're always thinking about the next transfer when you're dealing with deeds. It's not this one we're so much concerned about. It's what are we going? What is it, what's going to happen when they get ready to sell it? Is everything going to be in order when they get ready to sell? Okay. And then the last thing I want to talk about before we take our lunch break here is the only math that's involved in this. And I know I said we were done with math, but this is so easy as to not even qualify as math. Quite honestly. Um, excise taxes. And this was on your little uh, property tax handout worksheet. I kind of stuck it in there for some reason I was thinking it was in chapter 3. But it's here in chapter 5. Excise taxes are transfer taxes. They're sales taxes. Sales taxes are paid by sellers. Okay. So I want you to remember that when we get to closing statements and, we, and we're calculating the excise tax, who are you going to charge for the excise tax? The seller. This is a seller expense. Now, in North Carolina, the rate for excise taxes is $1 for every $500 of sales price. And then it says, or portion thereof. That, that's the only wrinkle here. Let me talk about the old days, how this used to happen. Where did we say closings used to happen? At the courthouse. And so when you would have had a closing previously, you would have gone down in front of the clerk and paid the buyer for the property, or pay, pay the, buyer paid the seller for the property, and they would have done it in front of the clerk, and you would count off money. And so every time the set the buyer gave the seller five hundred dollars, 
buyer gives that to the seller, the seller was required to give the clerk what? A dollar. And the clerk would put a stamp on the deed to show that the tax had been paid. Does that make sense? And then the buyer gives the seller another $500, and the seller does what? Give the clerk a dollar. That's where the rate of $1 for every 500 Now, in today's society, we don't go down there and do it with stamps one at a time. What do you think we do? We simply take the purchase price and do what with it? Divide it by 500 That's all to calculate the excise taxes. Here's the wrinkle, though. The state doesn't know how to round. The state always rounds up. Always. So before you do your division, before you take that sales price and divide by 500, you have to ask yourself a question. Is the sales price in a perfect multiple of $500? Which means it's got to end in what? 500 or zeros, right? So three zeros or 500, perfectly. It's got to always end perfectly in 000 or 500. Does that make sense? What if it ends at 501? What are you going to do? Not six. It's got to end it. It goes up to 1,000. Does that make sense? They only round up. It has to be in perfect multiples of $500. So this sales price, $99,501. Is that a perfect multiple of 500? Thank you. It's not a perfect multiple of 500, correct? We have to make it a perfect multiple of 500, which means this either has to be 500 or what? 1,000. Does that make sense to everybody? And the state only rounds which way? Uh, uh. Up. So what is this going to become? $100,000. And then we're going to divide it by 500. And so the excise taxes would be what? 200 bucks? $200. Does that make sense to everybody? So just always make sure that the purchase price is in an exact multiple of 500. Here's what I would tell you. On a test, it won't be in a multiple of 500. Do you think they're going to test you on something silly like this? Yes. Absolutely. Because they want to know that you know it always rounds what? Up. So, let me ask you this question. If you just took 99,501 and divided by 500, what do you get for the excise taxes? 199 what? 0. 0. 0.00 what? 2. Do you think 199 might be an answer choice? Yes. Yeah. Do you think 199,01 might be an answer choice? Yes, what's the correct answer? 200. See what I mean? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, Travis, um, I have a previous uh, example with the $100,000 divided by 500. The answer actually came out to 220, and we were told to round up to 201. Is that correct? What now? The answer for 100000 divided by 500 is 220. 100000 divided by 500 is not 200000 200, $1.20. Maybe a hundred thousand one hundred dollars might be two hundred. But if it was two hundred and twenty, that would be two hundred. Well, if you do it the way I just showed you, it will never be that. Because no, if, it, if, if the number and I'm telling you, if you do it the way I just told you to, the number can't be $200.20. Okay. Because you're always going to make it a multiple of what before you divide? 500. It will always be a whole number if you do it that way. Does that make sense? If you're only going to get change if you forget to. Here's the thing. If you do excise taxes and you get change, the first thing you should, you should say is what? I'm wrong. I did it wrong. If you do the math of excise taxes, I did it wrong. Because if you have done it correctly, it's always going to be a whole number. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. 
If you make it in multiples of 500 first before you do the division, it will always be a whole number. Is everybody okay with that? All right. And that's the, the, only, the only math in chapter 5. That wraps up the voluntary alienation. So let's do this. Let's take your lunch break and come back at 1.35 and we'll talk about the involuntary alienation. Yeah, that's all right. Because you're asking the wrong question, and I'm trying to get your brain on a different track. Okay. So, I guess you want to 